Come on, clap along. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Now I want to see you. And I want to see you. Come on, let's sing that again. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes. And I want to see you. And I want to see you. Come on, let's go to see you. I am lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power of love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see you. Anybody want to see Jesus today? Hallelujah. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Well, let's praise him. Open the eyes of my heart, and I want to see you. And I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes. And I want to see you. Yes, Lord. And I want to see you. You high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power of love, and we sing holy, 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 I want to see you. We're going to sing holy, holy, here we go. Holy, holy. You're holy, holy, holy. I wanna see you. Come on, let's do that again. It sounded good. Come on. Holy, holy, holy. Sing to God. You are holy, holy, holy. Yes, you're holy, holy, holy. I wanna see you. Come on, church, one more time. Holy, 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 God, you're holy, 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 I want to see you. Open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, and I want to see I want to see you. One more time, open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, because I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, cause I want to see you, and I want to see you. Touch me, aren't you glad? And now. 
sense be cleansed and made me whole. I will never cease to praise Him. How shall it while eternity rolls? Because He touched me us. I'd like for you to turn with me this morning to the book of John, John chapter 13. I want to read in your hearing today verses 34 and 35. I want to speak to you on the subject entitled learning to love, learning to love. Not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, I preached two sermons on love. I preached a sermon on God loving us. How that God is such a God of love. And then not long ago, I preached another sermon on love about our responsibility toward the world. And that is that we are to love. We are to love. And today I want to talk to you again about love. And I don't know why the Lord is laying this on my heart so much lately. But I can't get away from this, this, this idea, this concept, this subject of love. And so John tells us, he, he writes the words of Jesus. If you have a red letter edition of the Bible, these words will be in red because they are the words of Jesus. And Jesus says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. By this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. May the Lord richly add his blessings to the reading of God's word. Learning to love. And the new commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. Sharon, can you just turn me down a tad? I hear a little echo. And he said, love as I have loved you. And by this will all men know that you are my disciples because you have loved one toward another. The church. When I talk about the church, who am I talking about? I'm talking about you and me. We're the church. We're God's church on this earth today. The church is the means by which God has chosen to reflect his kingdom on this earth. In fact, we are to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The church in its community 
should be a different way of living. Do I need to remind us this morning that we don't live like the world? We don't look like the world. We don't talk like the world. We don't act like the world. Jesus said you're in the world, but you're not of the world. Right. Amen? Amen? Yes. We're the church, and the church in its community should reflect a different way of living. Our relationships, our thoughts, our actions, our economies should all reflect God's vision for his creation. We're the new creation, saints. Amen. Amen. And we ought to reflect that new creation in Christ Jesus that he has built within us. We ought to reflect that day. We, the church, ought to offer the world an alternative from the brokenness of sin. Amen? We offer the alternative to sin. We don't go out in the world and sin like they do. You know, so many times in the church, we invite people to come and say, come to our church, drink from the water, drink from the well. And they come to church and they find out the church members are just as thirsty as they are. Amen? We need to reflect a different way of life. And we need to give people an alternative from the brokenness of sin. The church, however frail its ministry, is the means by which God equips, empowers, and forms his people to do his work in this world. We are the ones who are to proclaim his good news. And we ought to invite others to be a part of a story they know nothing about. Right. Amen. Amen. The world doesn't know your story. Do you remember when you were lost? Do you remember when you were just like they are? Do you remember when you came out of the world because you heard the voice of God? You heard Jesus crying out to you, come out of the wilderness, come out of your sin. And you said, yes, and he changed you. He turned you around. He made you a brand new person. That's the kind of life we ought to be living. Amen. Amen. I believe that we as God's church, we are living in challenging days. We're living in difficult times. It shouldn't be news to us, though. We've been hearing it time and time again. What did Paul tell Timothy? He said, in the last days, perilous times are going to come. What does that word perilous mean? Dangerous. We are living in dangerous days. Amen. We're living in dangerous times. He said, for men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. He said they will be haughty and high-minded. He said they would be out of control. He said many of them will have a form of godliness. In other words, they will go through the ritual of godliness, but they will deny any kind of power. Let me tell you something. Without the power, nobody changes. Amen. Without the power, nobody's healed. Without the power of God, nobody's made different. Without the power of God, new things don't come about. It takes the power of God. Right, Amen. Amen. Our future, I believe, is much brighter than our past. Because I believe we as the church are living in our greatest day of opportunity. We look around. Listen, this is not the day for us to crawl into our shell. Amen? This is not the time for us to get quiet. We ought to be shouting from the rooftop that Jesus saves. We ought to be shouting from the rooftop that it doesn't have to be this way. That there's a new way, a new life that we can have in Christ Jesus. This is, I believe this is our greatest day of opportunity. Of all the time that I know of in the church, I believe this day is better than the reform of the church. I believe this day is better than the Azusa Street 
uh, 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 revival movement that went on. I believe this can be our greatest day as a church if you and I will stand up with a voice loud and clear and say, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. And he can make a difference in your life. Amen. Give him praise. As Mordecai said to Esther, he said, for who knows but that we are come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I say to you, who knows? Some of you may look, as I've already stated, and say, I've never experienced anything like this. Listen, we ought to be privileged and we ought to be thankful that God chose this time in history to include us in the greatest work that is available for the church today, and that's to let our light shine in the world. Yes, amen. Jesus said, be as a city set up on a, a hill that men may see your good works and glorify the heavenly Father. This is the day for us to be different. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. This is the day for us to shine as a church like we've never shined before. Amen. But listen, if we're going to succeed, if we're going to be effective, if we're going to minister to the needs of those around us, we must learn to love. We must learn to love. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you. You see, some think this thing called love, the love of God, they think it's an option, something they can take or leave. Some people, when it comes to expressing and showing love, they have this take it or leave it attitude. Come on now. But listen, it's not an option. It's standard equipment for the church. Jesus said, I give you a commandment. He didn't say, I give you a suggestion. <laughs> Jesus had no suggestion box. He said, I give you a commandment. When people look at the church, what do they see? When the world looks at us as a church, and sadly, sadly, the church doesn't have a good reputation in the world today. That's a sad thing. Amen? Oh, saints, I wish I had time to preach this morning, really preach. But when the world looks at us as a church, what are they seeing when they look at us? When you say to a person, I'm a Christian. When you say to a person, I go to this church. When you say to that uh, a, a person in the world, I'm a part of that fellowship. What do they see? What do they understand about you? What do they understand about what you represent? What do they see the church to be in the world today? When they hear the words that come out of our mouths, are they words that are filled with love and kindness and compassion? Come on now. When they look at our attitude and they see our attitude, is our attitude seasoned with love and thoughtfulness toward people we even disagree with and who disagree with us? Do they see a reflection of the love of Jesus Christ in us? Come on now. Are our actions actions that represent God and his love for a lost and dying world? Is that what they hear when, when words come out of our mouths? Is that what they see when they look at what we do and look at our attitude? Are they looking? Listen, Tertullian was a second century historian. He wrote a 35,000 word 
turned to the, to the ruler of Rome because the church was being so persecuted by the Roman government. He wrote a 35,000 word letter to the, to the ruler of Rome. And in that letter, he said, look at what they do. Look at how they love. Look at how they reach out to the poor. Look at how they minister to the needs of those around them. Even people they disagree with. Even people that hate them. They still love them. That's a good argument for the church. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. 1 John 4 and 7, 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loves knows God and is born of God. He that loves not does not know God. For God is love. Verse 16, skip on down. And we have known and believed the love that God has in us. The love that God has in us. The Bible tells us that God, for the child, the born-again child of God, that the Holy Spirit has deposited within us love, and he shed it abroad in our hearts uh, toward our fellow man. Amen? Amen. And we have known and believed the love that God has in us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God. And God dwells in him. New commandment that I, I give you. What? That you love one another. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know the love of God. How do I know that God loves me? John says, I'm going to show you how God loves you. By this we know the love of God. Why? Because he laid down his life that's how we know we, he loves us because he laid down his life for us and we you see the natural assumption should be if God laid down his life for me I ought to lay my, down my life for him but that's not what the scripture says it says because we know the love of God and that he laid down his life for us we ought to lay down our lives for one another. We didn't lay down our lives for the church. We lay down our lives for the lost and the dying. By this we know the love of God. By what? The fact that he laid down his life for us. And because of his love, that love that compelled him to die for us, we now have a responsibility. We have a divine duty, a divine responsibility, and that responsibility is to love each other. Amen? Somebody say, that's good preaching, Pastor. Somewhere in our past, I don't know when it happened. I don't know how it happened. I don't know why it happened. But somewhere in our past, someone fell prey to the thought that holiness is hardness and that righteousness is harshness. That because we're holy, we should be hard. Because we're righteous, we're harsh. We're austere. We're always serious. Come on, lighten up a little bit. Let the love of Jesus reign in your heart. Let the joy of God. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Get happy. Amen. Put on a smile. Let people see the joy that Jesus has in your life. But it's, holiness is not harshness. And righteousness is not meanness. Listen, that mean, that cold, that harsh attitude did not come from God. And if it didn't come from God, where does it come from? 
Come on now. Turn to somebody and say, he's preaching now. He's preaching now. <laughs> Ephesians 4, verses 30 and 32. And grieve not the Holy Spirit. Do you know you can grieve the Holy Spirit? You can hurt the heart of the Holy Spirit. You can grieve him. You can hurt him. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Those things should not be in us. Wrath, anger, hurtful words. Those things should not live within us. Paul said, throw them away. Get rid of them. Rid yourself of those things. Don't let those things uh, uh, fester in your life. Listen, the more you're touched of God, the more you learn about God, the more you're used of God, the more your heart becomes tender and loving and kind and gentle toward other people. Amen. Amen. So as Christians, listen, we talk a lot. We're Pentecostal. We talk a lot about the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe they were given to the church, for the church, by God, so the church could go out into the world and reach souls, minister to needs. But listen, don't talk to me about the gifts of the Spirit until you start producing some fruit. Amen? Until you start producing the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, Pastor, first of all, what is the fruit of the Spirit? That is what the Holy Spirit produces in your life. The Holy Spirit takes root in you. He grows up in you. He sprouts branches in you. He starts producing fruit in you. When you let him. More now. What's the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and meekness and gentleness and long suffering and goodness. Let's start producing the fruit before we start talking about anything else. Before we start talking about how good we are and how righteous we are and how holy we are, let's start producing some fruit. Amen. Isn't that what Jesus prayed for the church? He said that your fruit might be fruitful. Amen. That your life would be fruitful. As Christians and as children of God, we must learn to love. We have to. Saints, we have to draw a sand in the line and say, I'm not going to allow malice or hard feelings or bitterness take control of my life. I'm going to do what Jesus commanded me to do. I'm going to love people. We ought to be loving God, loving people, and reaching out with that love to a world that's lost and dying and saying, I know a better way. You don't have to live with heartache and pain. You don't have to live with hurt. You don't have to live that kind of life. You can have the joy of the Lord living in you. You can be a happy individual. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's the message of the church. Yes, give him praise. We've got to learn to love one another, saints. And how do we do that? How are we supposed to love? Jesus said, love as I have loved. Love as I have loved. Listen, this love, this brand of love we are to have is not according to my standard. You see, all of us, if it was left up to us, we would have different standards of love. Come on, friend. If it was left up to us, we would say, I can love you, but I don't love you. I love people that look like me. If you don't look like me, I don't love you. Come on now. I believe, let me, can I say this? I believe prejudice is the most ignorant thing Thing a person can live about. Amen. It's ignorance. Amen. Because it is not born out of love. 
Jesus said, love like I love. Love like I love. It's not my own brand of love. But it's the same love Christ has. It's the same love I'm supposed to have. It's his brand of love. I'm to love the way he loves. I'm the, to love the way he showed us when he came to this world and reached out. The Bible says he was a friend of the sinner. Amen. The Bible says he loved the publican. That was his brand of love. Love as Christ loves. We are to know how. Jesus wants us to love, and we must discover how Jesus loved. The Bible says he loved the sinner. He loved the backslider. He loved the adulterer. He loved the tax collector. The most hated person in Jerusalem was a tax collector, and he loved them, and he went around, and he recruited them as his disciples. Matthew was a tax collector. But Jesus said, come and follow me. Amen. He loved the denier. He loved the betrayer. He loved the rich. He loved the poor. He loved the thief hanging on the cross. This day, you shall be with me in paradise. He loved everybody he came in contact with. He loves you when you're right. And he loves you when you're wrong. He loves you when you're naughty. He loves you when you're nice. He loves you when you're good. He loves you when you're bad. He loves you unconditionally. There is nothing you can do to make Jesus stop loving you. He loves that worst sinner. I don't know who they are or where they live. They may not even live in a house. They may live out on the street. I don't care who they are. He loves them. And he loves them with an everlasting love. And he says, that's the kind of love you're supposed to have as my church, as my people, as my children. You are to love the way I love. What does that mean? I love everybody. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's the way we love. The way he loves. And last of all, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. You know, many groups are identified by their mottos. Some are identified by the caps they wear. Some are identified by the way they dress. They may have a particular uniform that identifies them with a particular group. Some people are identified by their rites and their ceremonies. Some are identified by their emblems and their flags. And some are even identified by their handshake. Some have secret handshakes. And that identifies them as belonging to a particular group. But Jesus said, my disciples, my people are going to be different. You're not identified by what you wear. You're not identified by an emblem or a flag or a symbol. He said, my disciples will be known by one thing, how they love. How they love. He said, everybody, all men will know you're my disciples. Listen, I believe we're a friendly church. I know we're a friendly church. But when visitors walk in that door, our friendliness not, should not be the first thing they see. When somebody walks in that door for the first time into this church among this body, the thing that should stand out more than anything else is the way we love each other. We may not have the best of everything. You may not have the best preacher. You may not have the best musicians. You may not have the best music. You may not have the best uh, 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 programs. But listen, the one thing that should stand out is how we love each other. 
and we love you for it. That we don't backbite. Amen? Amen. We don't talk bad about each other. We don't put somebody down when they fail. When they don't live up to our standard. When they don't do what we think they ought to do. We don't criticize. We love them. We love them. If they're a Christian, we love them. If they're not a Christian, we love them. Doesn't matter who they are. We are to love like Jesus loved. That's our identification. By this shall you know that men know that you're my disciples because you have loved one for another. Coming to a close, 1 Peter 4 and 8 says, Above all things, above all things, above all things, above everything, that you have fervent love one for one another. Fervent love among yourselves. Listen, if we can't, if we can't love each other, if I can't love you, who can I love? If I can't love my fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, who can I love? Peter says, above everything that you could do, think, act, say, you should have fervent love among yourselves. He says, have fervent love for love, he said, love shall cover a multitude of sins. Some have a difficult time understanding that scripture. Love will cover a multitude of sin. Peter's not talking about a love cover-up, a sin cover-up. He's not saying that God loves you so much he overlooks your sin because of his love. That's not what he's talking about. He says love covers. Love is a cover Love should cover this church. Love should be draped over this church like a great tablecloth. Love covers a multitude of sin. What does that mean? That when somebody does me wrong, when somebody speaks out against me, I don't lash out back at them. Why? Because I'm to have love. And love will keep me from sinning. Be ye therefore angry, but sin not. When I get angry, it's love that checks me and says, no, you don't act like that because you're a Christian. You're a child of God. You're born again. You're washed in the blood. You don't do this. You don't talk like that. You don't act like Oh, but I got angry. Is that your excuse? Are you going to let anger keep you out of heaven? Love will cover a multitude of sin. Love will keep me from getting angry. Love will keep me from lashing out. Love will keep me from wanting to get back. Love will keep me, my mouth shut, when I should keep my mouth shut. Amen. Come on now. Love will cover a multitude of sin. Love will cause me not to be critical of other people when I think I have a right to be critical. But because I love them and because the love of God lives in my heart, I refuse to be critical. Amen. Come on now. Love stops the anger in its tracks. Love will stop unforgiveness. If I love you and you do me wrong, I'll forgive you. Instead of wanting to get revenge. Love will cover a multitude of sin. It'll be forgiving. It'll be compassionate. It'll be caring. 
Thank God for, listen, thank God for brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank God for you. Thank God when I'm hurting, I can go to you and know that you're there and you love me and you care about me and you won't stab me in the back. You won't criticize me. I can tell you my problems. The Bible says that we are to confess our faults one to another that we might be healed. Healing only comes through confession and it's through love that we love one another. Thank God for born again believers. Amen. Amen. Thank God for Christians. I can expect the world to criticize me. I can expect the world not to love me. I can expect them to hate me, but I don't expect you to do it. You're a child of God. You're born again. You're washed in the blood. We're different. Amen. Thank God for brothers and sisters in the Lord. We can hold one another up. When you're bearing a burden. And you can say pray for me. I'm struggling. I'm going through a hard time. And at that moment. I don't know about you. But when your heart breaks. My heart breaks. When you hurt. I hurt. When you suffer. I suffer. Why? Because we're connected. By the love of Jesus Christ. Proverbs. 17 and 17 says. A friend loves at all times. But a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times. But a brother, a sister, is born for the time of adversity. You weren't born into this family to help me when I'm up. You weren't born into the family of God to help me when everything's going good. You were born for the time of adversity. When I'm going through a trial, when I'm facing a hardship, when I'm struggling to make it through the next day, that's why you're here. You're here to love me and help me when I need you. Amen. That's what the Word of God says. You are born for a time of trouble. Listen. Who's going to be there when you're wounded? When you lie on the ground, bruised and bleeding, and you've been wounded, who's going to go and pick you up and help you pour in the oil, pour in the wine, like the good Samaritan? The Bible says a man was traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem. That road from Jericho to Jerusalem was a hard road. People got robbed every day there. It was like living in Harlem. It was like living in, in, in some uh, 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 desperate place. And the Bible says, Jesus said, a man was traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem. And he fell among thieves and they beat him. They stripped him naked of his clothes. They stole his money and everything he had and left him bleeding and bruised and dying on the side of the road. And a priest came by. A priest. Who's the priest? He's the one who represents God to man. He's the connection. He's the advocate between man and God. And when he saw the man, what did he do? He crossed over on the other side of the street and ignored him. Then Jesus said, a Levite came along. Who's the Levite? He's the one connected to the church. He's the one that serves God. He's the one that serves the church. He's the one that's involved in religious activity. What did the Levite do? He crossed over to the other side and ignored him. But a Samaritan, a Samaritan, one of the most hated people of the Jews, saw him and went to him and he dressed his wounds. He poured in the oil. He poured in the wine. He put him on his beast of birth. He took him to a hotel. He paid the, the, the manager, said, you take care of it. Take it from this money. When I come back, if you spend more than this money, I'll give you whatever you need to take care of this man. A stranger, somebody he didn't know. Awesome. 
who will be there when you're wounded? Will love cover you when you're bleeding, when you're hurting, when you're dying? It's brotherly and sisterly love that comes and pours in the oil, pours in the wine. Love covers with acts of kindness. Love covers with acts of compassion. Love covers with the good one, the grace of God. That's it. If it weren't for the grace of God, Listen, I don't know the burdens you bear. I don't know what you go through. I don't know what you feel when you're lying in bed at night all by yourself. You're there in the darkness alone. It's just you and God. I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how you felt. I don't know the hardships you faced. You're my brother and you're my sister. I should be there to help you. I should be there to hold out a hand of love and caring and concern. Say, what can I do? Can I pray out? What can I do? Bind up your wounds. What can I do? Bring you back to holy. God's people washed in blood.